sir. This is episode 32. We have our good friend Alec on. He's already been on once before. We're having him back on this week. Um, we were on a brief hiatus, but we're back to making content. The show is back. Um, so, yeah. Um, Alec, how you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on again, guys. Absolutely. Boys, how are you guys doing? Pretty good. I'm doing well. Chilling, nice. Enjoying the night. Awesome. So, Alec, since we, we had you on last time, you actually started your own podcast with a few friends. you care to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so I'm doing a, a music-based podcast with my two friends from back home in Connecticut. Uh, it's called Van Jammin, and we're doing a variety of music. We're covering basically like Grateful Dead, uh, Pearl Jam, Jimi Hendrix, Fish, a bunch of different rock music hoping to expand beyond that and uh yeah we're basically um combining our music and film interests uh my two other welcome back to episode four of van jammin uh this is our fourth of july special baby Yes. Yeah. Independence Day. Your three hosts, Alec Maskell. Braden Sunshine. And David Kuhn. All right. And today we are doing one of my favorite shows that I know of, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Live at Woodstock. Yeah. So the, one of the most famous live film concerts. interests. Uh, my two other friends are both like performing musicians and my friend David uh, one of the three co-hosts is actually doing music production for his major down at UHart. So, yeah, it's cool that you guys are in- infusing like both your music and film and audio interests. Because the one thing I will say is like our podcast, you can kind of tell it's like shot by business majors. But like I, I urge everyone to go up, over and check out Van Champ Van Jammin. We'll link it somewhere. But like it's shot beautifully. Like you guys just did an episode, uh, like near the water it was probably near a lake or a pond where you guys were in like uh camping chairs and it looked like the way it was shot was beautiful same with the first episode in the van like it's really nice aesthetics that you guys establish and then uh the mics as well like you guys i know you use like um i don't know what they're called like almost like stage mics but i don't know what they're mm-hmm. like i don't know the name for them but like it's really cool i like the way it's shot yeah, um, we use like real like directional mics. Uh, Braden, uh, one of the three co-hosts, was actually on The Voice years back. So he's like a very talented musician and he tours all around southeastern Connecticut. Um, so, yeah, we use, you know, a lot of his gear. David's done uh, an immaculate job with the sound mixing. Like if it was just me, this I would not our first do. episode. And it, it's kind of the, it's kind of Alex brainchild, but we've all been into the Grateful Dead for a very long time. You know, well, uh, me more recently than you guys. Okay. But still, I, like really the only last like three years. You've come me. a long but, way in three years. Yes. Yes. But, um, because of our, our shared love of their music and their, their whole persona and vibe, we decided to get together and, and sit down and, and record some of our, musings about their music and their journey as musicians so uh with that this is our first uh edition of that podcast hopefully coming at you a couple of times and alec is going to introduce this show that we listened to over the past week just to get prepared yes. for this tell discussion. us about it please. well actually so before <laughs> so before <laughs> before we hop into the show um i figured we'll just all go over a little bit quick like what we all do um Oh, yeah. With yeah. the sound mixing. Like, if it was just me, I would not be able to do it. Um, and he also has put out an audio-only version on Spotify and Apple Music and basically everywhere. Um, so there's there's the podcast lives on YouTube and in a bunch of different places. But, yeah, and then, you know, camera-wise, um, we've been using my, a, or my Sony A6400 uh, and a GoPro. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I got that recently as well since I was on last time. Now, are you guys uploading like uh, 1080p or 4K and how many frames a second? You probably know. You're a junkie, you know all that. Yeah, we're doing like the normal kind of frame rate, like 29 frames per second, about 30. Yeah. Um, and then we've been doing a variety. We've had some that have been in 10, 1080. I could be wrong. I actually think the last 4th of July special, I got it in 4K. Um, okay. 
I know you can do 1440 too, but I don't know what the diff. I don't know if there's a difference there or not. But I'm pretty sure it's just a little bit more upscaled from 1080. I don't yeah. really know. But yeah, and then we we also had two episodes that were on Zoom because those guys are in Connecticut, so those were a little bit more like how your guys comes out. It was a little grainier, and the audio wasn't quite as good, but it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the Zoom episode too. It's actually a lot easier and more casual to like do it from anywhere. Personally, I prefer them, but no, I get what you mean. And like, you definitely have to toy around with different applications because we like Skype personally, but yeah. like we tried Zoom and we tried uh, there. What do we try? We also tried uh, Discord, and we just didn't land on Skype because it kind of worked with us. I actually think your guys set up, yeah, like I've been, I've been learning a lot, um, kind of through you guys, like just watch after watching how you guys set up the podcast, uh, has kind of been my starting ground for how we set up ours, but I like your Skype setup like way more than zoom. I think that the only nice thing with zoom is that it does do like an automated edit for you. So you don't have to do tons of visual editing the thing i actually like uh, the one difference that i like is uh zoom automatically it's kind of like what google i think it was google group or google plus used to do it where it automatically switches to the speaker yeah so like if you're if you're in uh skype you have to manually do that or set up different scenes and it's it's like the person's already talking by the time you do it so yeah it's not like it's not ideal but uh I still like Skype because it's a lot easier, I think, to put an overlay in for it. Like, you can just pull audio and video and then put it into OBS, and it's easier. Yeah. Uh, from when we first started, Skype's improved in terms of their video and uh, audio quality, too, by a lot. A lot of it has to do with the user, too. Like, what equipment are you using? A lot. Of, it actually, like, matters. Like, uh, Bert, you upgraded your, or B, you upgraded your uh, or camera, and it's, like, vastly better than it was like when we started it's every small improvement actually matters it's it's true it's just yeah, like it's the so, long game speaking of improvements so your guys your guys audio is like fucking flawless it's like crystal oh, yeah. clear yeah on van jamming dope. everyone should go over there and check it out if you're into music rock and also just if you want to like see a beautiful audio and visual like i definitely encourage to check out that podcast yeah, yeah I was going to say, with the audio, don't you guys, you do, like, the multiple, like, you probably use, like, a mixer, right, with the multiple different inputs, mm -hmm. and that kind of also really helps with, like, uh, um, getting a good, like, proper balance of sound, because some people, like, put the mic closer to their mouth, you know, some people, like, talk louder, so it helps with the mixing, it's like, uh, as you would do it. Some people off the mic like Alex. Mm -hmm. Toss yeah, off. David's. Um, it's as if you would do it in a music studio. <laughs> is what I'm trying to say for like people who actually know what they're talking about. David. Yeah, David. Uh, David runs basically uh, the mics through when we're in, when we're in person at least. Uh, he runs the mics through a interface, and then um, you know each one their own channel. We do like a pre sound check and everything, obviously. And then um, you know in post he's playing around with eq and uh, uh i mean he's doing all kinds of stuff that i don't even know but yeah he basically the compression totally, and stuff like that yeah compression eq cleaning up the audio getting rid of you know feedback and adjusting volumes i he even i know goes through and even like pulls sounds out um and we'll get rid of stuff so it's yeah. pretty cool it's it's been good and then we do like a backup recording. I use my road mic as kind of like room tone and then as just like a different directional microphone to basically add some more depth to it. Um, but yeah, he does a really good job with the sound mix. It's it's great. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, they... But yeah, so uh, here we are now. Yeah. Do we want to <laughs> do we want to rip into the show? Yeah, let's get right into it. All right. Mm -hmm. I think, are we done with the, the uh... with intros? Yeah. yeah. With bios, yeah. 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 I think we'll, we'll, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, cut. We chose Wake Up to Find Out, so, which uh, is. Uh, I know uh, last time we were talking about some of the film projects you might want to take on or look into. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything you're really interested in right now or working towards? Yeah, so uh, I'm trying to work on screenwriting right now. I've been getting a little bit better at that, doing it. You know, as 
a little more often. Um, the screenwriting is hard, man. It's hard to to get yourself to sit every day and to to come out with something creative. But it is fun, and the days when you write something good, you feel better. Yeah. But uh, the two the two co hosts in the um in the podcast, Braden and David. I'm looking at doing actually a little short with them. Uh, we're going to do almost like a Of Mice and Men adaptation. Looking to film that soon. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I have a I have another film that is a little bit lengthier that I'm working on right now. It's kind of like a bank robbery thing, but it's going to include some stuff about COVID, some stuff about some media theory, uh, a range of different stuff. But I'm working on that at the moment. And... Uh, Alex and I are actually uh, about to begin a documentary. We're looking at starting something on the uh, Boston housing crisis. So that's cool too. So yeah. for uh, are you guys doing? Was it a mice of mice and men recreation? Yeah, it's basically going to be like they're like I've said. They're both really good musicians, uh, and they actually mm-hmm. just did a gig recently. They were playing some Grateful Dead tunes. So we're going to do it as almost like they're like a quasi little Grateful Dead duo. Like you know, like Lenny and uh, George and of mice and men, yeah. Yeah. and then okay. gonna kind of yeah. tie in some, some uh, I don't know, some different horror elements. I have a location I'm, I've scouted out for it that's kind of a David Lynchian vibe. So yeah. new, new script, new script, or are you guys uh, like yeah, new, s- new script where I just started it the other day, so. But That's we're going to awesome. probably be filming that in the next month or so. It's just going to be a short, something real slim. So I like that. I like that. Yeah, it's yeah. a cool idea. That is. Who's going to play Lenny? Do you know yet? <laughs> it's not going to be exact. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to use like the same names. It's just going to be yeah. like a loose kind of idea. Uh, More yeah. like the plot of, yeah. of Mason and Men. Yeah. But, but, yeah, that's yeah. a great book. I love that book. Yeah, I don't know if we. I don't know any Lennies, like any Lennies, <laughs> big, big guys. Not yeah. really. Yeah, usually when you find actors, they gotta they gotta have those names in real life too, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I just don't know. Like, not. I wasn't saying specifically Lenny. I was like someone who embodies Lenny's character. Yeah. I don't really know. Mm. I don't know. They have elements, just not the full. Think so. I give a few. Bro, careful, bro. We might be triggering people right now. No, no, I said elements, and as in height, you stick up, <laughs> get your mind out of the gutter. No, certain, certain guys, I can think of some. <laughs> yeah, but we won't, and we won't name names because the public does watch. This yeah, film. exactly. They they might find out about it, the Lennies. <laughs> Were you sh- right now? That should be a segment. Who sneaked this this week on Straight No Chaser? Yeah, yeah. the slide disc of Straight No Chaser this week. We're yeah, getting a little edgy, out. boys. We haven't gotten in trouble since SGA. Yeah. We need uh, a new controversy to boost our views. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, that's, though, that's basically everything uh, for right now. I, I have another project. I have I have a guy who just reached out to me. I might be going to work on his short film, but yeah. otherwise, the rest of the summer is just focusing on that stuff. Last thing I'll ask about, since you both are here, is you guys are thinking about doing like a documentary or film yeah. on the Boston housing crisis. Mm-hmm. So, basically, what's the issue, and like, what what intrigues you, and what do you plan to do for the documentary? Like, did you want to interview people? Like, uh, like what what's price increases? What's exactly happened? So, like, essentially, what we're trying to capture, we're trying to go for, it, is it's going to be like. Um, like a it's a documentary but it's done from like the style you like a very journalistic style which is where like uh it works with both of our majors and both of our career paths as he's film major i'm journalism major so basically we're going to be talking about like the ongoing housing crisis in boston which has kind of been it's getting it's gotten like there's points where it's gotten better but then there's also points where it's gotten worse overall it's becoming a bigger issue to people who are poorer and people um who it tends to affect minorities as well too but it's especially the lower class people and um so basically like it has to do with uh, increasing rent for example that's a start increasing rent which uh 
like a lot of people moving from outside, rich people from the suburbs moving into the city, which then contributes to gentrification. And then people can't pay rent, so it contributes to evictions. And then there's a thing, other factors that go into play, like redlining, where people um, were never sold houses in certain neighborhoods because of their backgrounds, whether it be racially or socioeconomically. And then finally, homelessness as a result of these people getting pushed out of the neighborhoods by the increasing house prices and gentrified neighborhoods. The so one thing like I will say, following I'm, that plot, I'm a bit surprised that. I've like more rich people are gentrifying the city, but it's weird too at the same time because I thought the suburbs were going to grow in populations because of the fact that coronavirus would make like city populations disperse. But it doesn't seem like that's exactly happened, to be honest with you, because prices, there's actually more demand for population centric or like or more dense population areas. Like there's more demand for units in these areas and then yeah. the prices increase. So it's well, weird hearing, how that's happening. I've been hearing that across the country actually re- most recently, um, there's been a lot of people flocking back to cities. So rent's been going up all over the country in almost every city. I but think the problem is, did rent ever around. rent barely went down during the pandemic? No, it really, it really, it really it didn't, it didn't kept really up with at all. Yeah. But it that's barely true. It barely, it didn't go down. You it stayed I, guess I, mean, I guess I mean like the demand as opposed to maybe the price. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, it was much easier. It was much, much easier to get an apartment Supply, or a house. Yeah. Price. Yeah. Dur- yeah. During the pandemic, it was way easier to get a house or an apartment because like, there was loads of them that weren't getting filled with people. Because people were like staying home. Like college students were staying home. They weren't coming to school in the city. And people were working from home. And they had no reason to move into the city to find a new job. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. That 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 kept the demand up, but the rent never went down, which pissed a lot of people off. And a lot of people lost their jobs due to the uh, pandemic, so they became unemployed and then were unable to pay rent. That's, to me, yeah. though, that's bullshit. That there should be laws against that because if you think about supply eco- or supply side economics, they, they didn't follow the demand rules. Okay, yeah. they didn't lower prices. They kept prices too high, which fucked a lot of poor people over. And it left a lot of units empty. But these people didn't give a fuck because as long as the property's mortgages were paid off, they don't care. If well, people are the, I know one market that was super prevalent in and is like pretty open, like common practice is New York. I think Boston actually offers more protection laws, but... I think it's unavoidable in a city where there's a lot of like industry coming in, right? Like in a city where there's a lot of jobs, there's it's just gonna keep they're gonna keep gentrifying slowly towards the outskirts of it. Yeah, but we're I mean, gonna I'm, like no, you can go ahead. Just show you a bit of corruption in the system though, because they're not actually changing prices due due to demand. They're only changing them when it favors price increases. Problem. Yeah, and once price increases, it never goes back down unless it's yeah. like gas. That's well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, that's fucking bullshit. Yeah, anyway, right. continue, Alan. I just was going to add in, I mean, another thing is Sven and I, um, we've had multiple conversations about like, you know, we're still, we're still, we're about to start kind of like filming, like probably even this week, actually. Um, so there's elements of this that we might have to cut, like that might not just fit fit in with the flow um and there's you know there's also a with with making a documentary there's also a certain amount of like wiggle room where like someone's answer will kind of maybe lead you on a path you didn't expect but another thing we've been just discussing is like how much we want to even include the theme of like covid in like the past year because i i think we've been discussing almost taking the approach of more of like how this problem has been getting worse over in like the past 10 years as opposed yeah. to just so long just during issue. the past year but uh that's fair yeah because yeah. businesses will try and act like covid caused everything but yeah. it's it's very important to know trends that were apparent before covid too. yeah yeah it's a good yeah, thing COVID just stuff had, was starting yeah before COVID. COVID. covid just kind of added fuel to the fire and um it's like an already ongoing problem that it actually it got worse way worse like in the 90s and 2000s because the city of boston actually became like more of like a more affluent and clean like kind of more cleaned up so to say place um back when um under like mayor menino and stuff and he actually did do a lot 
to help out um lesser privileged communities but that still didn't stop like gentrification like especially in east boston and southie like loads of like local people were moving out but we are gonna so in this in the um in the doc we are gonna we're gonna try and get a mix of like sources like interviews with people who are like experts on the issues people work in public housing and people who work like politicians who work in um cover like uh urban development and that kind of um departments and then we're also going to try and get some just like actual locals who've been affected by the housing crisis you guys should ask you guys should ask property comp or companies for comment Uh, you guys should actually reach out to developers real estate developers yeah and see if they i doubt most most of them won't actually give you the time of day but one of them might oh no there there are some like you could probably get connected through like a suffolk network like if you reach out to like teachers and stuff they'd probably be able to get like an alum or like someone that works in the industry you might actually yeah i know some i know some guys who like uh graduated from suffolk or who go to other schools who are like in um who are uh in the in real estate I was gonna say seaport well, isn't actually an area that's as hard hit by gentrification because it's all industrial before it wasn't residential yeah. like See, the I, development it, there actually helped local people it, the big problem is right um around. is uh the areas like in southie and Easty, like the gentrification is closing down local businesses it's closing down shops and the way like we're not sure if we're going to put this as part of like we're, we still haven't like completely decided like the outcome of the doc if we're going to kind of have it have more of like a um like a message where you want to take an initiative or more of a message where you just want to spread awareness but a uh, kind of way to prevent uh um gentrification from happening as fast is to like support local small businesses go to like local convenience stores bodegas don't shop at like fucking whole foods and stuff and all those like posh joe's Trader now Joe's local business. Trader Joe's is amazing. I mean, at least Trader Joe's they 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 they're not as expensive, and they employ a lot of people, um, from lower income backgrounds. But it's still like not. It doesn't hit the same as like a corner store. I just wanted like to say store. my two other things. I just wanted to point out with the doc. Um, one one thing, one element um that I wanted to include on this one is there was this article I read recently in the New York Times about uh, American cities since the 1950s when we started have been built around certain neighborhoods to keep those neighborhoods like disconnected from downtown, disconnected from business and everything else. So, you know, Dorchester, for example, like I've spent a lot of time with Lux down in Dorchester and like every time I go, it's, you know, the highway, any which direction cuts it off from downtown. Um, you know, same thing with the East. You, and then on top of that, you also have environmental issues that are affecting those areas. Wait, are there no are there no highway exits in Dorchester? No, there are. No, there's a lot. Exits. I just oh, mean okay. that, like, like uh, logistically and geographically, it just it's it's a huge divider. People downtown. live like right under there too. Yeah. It's not oh. like good real estate because the highway then, okay. your backyard. I have to be honest, I haven't. Been. Was, uh, wasn't Dorchester one of those like heavily redlined areas where it was harder to access downtown from the highway? way like like back in the 50s yeah and and then on top of that as well you have um you know both dorchester has like a plant that's nearby and also with Eastie, you have the airport nearby so those areas are hit so hard with like environmental issues and then on top of that like the, the you know the price of housing there it's no different than it is downtown and it's, that's the um, problem i think too is like i've noticed this in most parts of boston pricing doesn't actually reflect the access no. to different resources you get no. like yeah, not at all grossly out proportion no, no matter what your neighborhood is like you're paying way above national average most of the time like 60 80 100 percent above national average yeah yeah um the only other thing I just wanted to say real quick was with the with like Sven mentioned earlier, uh, I've been really influenced. There's there's a few films I watched recently that uh, have used. I've just been very interested in films that have a lot of like journalism ingrained in the plot and both in maybe like visual style. There's a film I watched recently by Michael Haneke, a uh, really good director from Europe, and um, 
or Austrian director actually. And uh, right, that's he had a, Europe, I forgot. <laughs> I was trying to remember which country he was from. But uh, he did a film called Code Unknown, which was about like society in France and our modern society. But there's a character in it who um, is a, a photojournalist and travels overseas and covers war. And there's just the way he, he ingrains um, the journalist kind of sensibility and the, the photo element into the film is it's just done beautifully. And I've I've been really interested in films that have been doing that. So in our doc, we also want to almost have Sven act as like a like a quasi journalist like narrator. So sequences where he's literally kind of almost set up in like a, a normal broadcast. Yeah, like, like it's shot. a video, like it's a what is it? A voiceover sound on tape kind of like new style broadcast. Yeah. So we want to okay. want to use that in almost like a a slightly obvious kind of Qua, not a not a fake way, but almost as just like a stylistic choice, I guess. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Speaking of journalists, uh, a lot of them are getting arrested lately, and detained and imprisoned, and uh, overall just oppressed by governments. So, um, uh, at least 117 journalists were detained in 2020, making it a record number worldwide. Um, you saw this huge influx in journalists who were trying to uh, report on the pandemic, the lockdown, and um, pro- protests that broke up as a uh, broke out as a result of um, BLM and the uh, the George Floyd um, incident that happened where he was murdered. So um, because of that, a lot of uh, it wasn't just a U.S. phenomenon though. There was uh, a lot of it was in the U.S. Surprisingly, actually, because really? it's like, wait, like wait, like no, we're not talking about like, getting murder. arrested. Yeah, police, yeah like, not like yeah in the U.S. Not jailed, but like arrested. That's wow. weird. Like uh, um, CNN, I believe, was arrested live on camera when they were reporting in uh, Minneapolis after the George Floyd incident. The most American thing that's ever happened. Yeah, it's a threat to Fox, our... Fox, MSNBC, and CNN journalists should all get arrested and thrown in prison. <laughs> they should I let mean, the economists it's a, fight. It's a little... It's a, it's a little <laughs> dictatorial, bro. Yeah, it's like, we still have the First Amendment. They can be a shit in media company as much as they want, but we got they, the First Amendment. Yeah, even like, like Buzz, you gotta get deserves. right in there. Uh, yeah, even Buzz and deserves to be out there. I mean, there's but, some... Um, some yeah, a lot of most... them was in the U.S., believe it or not. Like, they were when they were reporting on the Minneapolis um, protest or, like, the, the protest in Portland when the, the whole city kind of went, like, when uh, Trump got, like, the National Guard in there to arrest people. Damn. Um, with all that crap, people got arrested there as well. And, um, yeah, it, like, it was not jail. It's not that bad. But it's basically, not, you, you see this. It's not, this, like, as bad as it is globally where, like, they'll yeah. actually, like, make it disappear and shit. Yeah, but it it was a global yeah phenomenon. So, um, what other countries were most affected by it? So the countries that have detained the most journalists in the past year was uh, Belarus, China, Turkey, uh, Turkmenistan, North Korea, and um, Eritrea. Mm-hmm. They're some of the least free countries. And I'm, uh, watch, I'm not one? gonna lie, I'm, I, I don't think I know that last one. <laughs> what even is that? What where is, where is Ethiopia? It? Oh, what is it called? Okay. Eritrea. Eritrea? Is it yeah, a new East country? African country. Yeah. No, it's, it old. A... it's actually like one of the oldest fucking places. Jeez, how small but they have it, is it? Like have, Luxembourg size? No, it's not that small, but it's like really? it's it's next to um, it's next to Ethiopia and Somalia. But, uh, um, okay. I, I watched a documentary recently the vice did um it, and it was only from like i think like last year maybe like late 2019 but it was about like the uyghurs and yeah and the crisis in china and it was just i was i was actually talking about it with a b recently and it's just crazy like these journalists they're they're the whole time they're trying to hide their stuff and they're constantly getting their footage deleted and like they had to leave certain regions literally because they were like on the verge of getting arrested and they're just the surveillance over there it's it's insanity every like, yeah. five feet you got like three cameras on you well the, the right? surveillance here is pretty insane too it's just like the american 
government isn't as hardcore as some yeah. of these other guys. We I actually noticed, uh, like, Brian Fogel, the guy who made Icarus, is making a new documentary, and he was telling me that one of his friends in Saudi Arabia was illegally recording, like, street interactions, because it's illegal to film on, like, the streets. Mm -hmm. It's only, like, you can only get government permission to record things in Saudi Arabia, because they want to project... Yeah the certain lifestyle that most Saudis lead, which isn't actually the lived experience yeah. from like Saudis on the ground. But like, if they catch you with this equipment, you get thrown in prison and you'll never come out. Well, yeah. There's one guy who got jailed. I forget his name, but uh, he's still in prison today. Disappear. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say Saudi is also Saudi and uh, Russia are also among those countries in Kazakhstan. India, are, like, India actually made world. that list for like one of the countries that like it lost a lot of credit. Uh, Associated Press makes a list, right? In terms of like yeah. the most uh, free journalistic countries in the world. India started moving up on that in terms of. Really? Yeah. 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 I was looking at the um, the Press Freedom Index. Yeah, press so that's from Reporters those, Without Borders. Oh, that's okay. uh, that shows you. Yeah, yeah, the U.S. unfortunately is no longer a good situation. It's just a satisfactory situation, which makes me really sad. Wow. And like when you look at the map, there's very few countries that even are in the top tier anymore. Like the the good situations, literally like Ireland, the Nordic countries, Holland, and New Zealand. Yeah, those guys yeah, are at the top of like every every fucking like modern list right now. Like they have yeah. like the best indexes for like raising children, women, like jobs, like balance with work. What are they doing well, you know up what, there? It's crazy. You know what's another one though that's actually up with very high with press freedom, which you would not expect at all. Wait, with no, press freedom? Huh? With with press freedom or with, against? Yeah, very with, very free press. Yeah. Like you would not expect. No shade to this country, but you would not expect. Mm. Who? Jamaica. <laughs> They're like one of the top. Really? They're high no, I would expect place. that. I feel like I would expect that. They I don't know if they want the the down though. there. I don't know. I don't really know anything about Jamaica's. I, most Latin American countries, I feel like I know nothing about their governments. Some yeah, of them are yeah, corrupt. Yeah, really don't because Jamaica's not Latin American. I'm actually slightly like, surprised. It? How I'm not Latin American. It's just Caribbean. It's Caribbean. They're not oh, Latin. Caribbean. Yeah. They're, they're British. Wasn't well, that that whole section is technically... Yeah, but you don't call, like, they don't call themselves that because they were they were like British for yeah, a while. Like, Car I'm looking at this right now. I'm surprised like Germany is as high as it is on this list. Yeah. Well, with that, like with in the, a good way or not bad being way? free, it went down. I know. No, with being free, like it's still oh, it's higher free. than Canada. Yeah, yeah, Germany should be very low on the list. It should be very against freedom of press That's because it is. Thing. Those yeah. people are are fucked up. The UK went down a lot too. I'm not surprised about that. I'm not surprised the EDL and the UK IP. I'm actually and in like, I know in Eastern Europe it went down a lot too, like Poland, Hungary. They have they've had some problems. I'm surprised with that Germany's <laughs> high, higher than Canada because like in Germany, can't you get arrested? But like like you don't have like free speech in Germany. I thought right. There's well, a lot they of do stuff until you say it. hateful shit. Okay. Yeah. You that's also, also not can. just Germany. That's how it is in the UK. Yeah. You also no, can't, not. like, use... They're very, very strict on, like, when you do or don't use the swastika. I'm pretty sure you can't even really use it in, like, new in most, like, newscasts, even if you were, like, reporting on it. Uh, yeah. No, you can use it if it's educational. So if you it's can. in a museum okay. or if you're making a movie about history, you can. And if, it's a re if you actually use it for its original religious purpose, that's permitted yeah. as well. Yeah. So... The, the um, reason it was used for like thousands of years before yeah. Hitler, yeah. like thousands, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, no. In some, in some, in some countries, what you can get in trouble for is like ridiculous now. Like you can get in trouble for like social media posts, and they'll arrest you. Like yeah. uh, that's not okay, man. to be honest. That's crazy. I don't even like care how you're saying, to be honest. I think that's so stupid. It's a bit dystopian. Yeah. Yeah. I know. When we when we lose, you know, I always think about like the the I I don't really read the Washington Post. I I feel they're a little swayed by good old Bezos now, but uh, I do love their logo. Their like log line, like when or I forget exactly the wording, but it's like 
darkness and or it's like without press there's darkness and democracy or something and mm. it's so true like you yeah. you use you lose the ability to let people know what's going on and the common you know the common day person loses their voice and their ability to learn basically like it's very important he doesn't ever report negatively yeah. like this man mm. the that's goddamn true <laughs> no. there but yeah no i agree i mean like the problem is, I feel like there's trade trade offs. Like, this is a problem with how privatized um, our ability to communicate with each other is becoming. Is like when you have like the U.S. government, ha the federal government has a constitution. Okay, they have to respect the the laws that have been put into place by the constitution. Private companies like Twitter and Facebook, they don't have to listen to the constitution. They get to make you sign and agree to whatever terms of service they want to put in that contract. And you're going to use the service because what are you going to do? Not communicate with other people. So they basically have this huge monopoly. So if you sign up and agree to communicate on their platform, they have the final say as to what is okay and what is not okay. Yeah, but I mean, to and be that, fair, you <laughs> willingly make the decision. Like, you, What are you going to do you otherwise? You say, yes, okay, I, I agree to your terms of service. Like you, The only you way to combat into that, that contract actively. The only way that's probably going to be done in the future to combat that is to make another application that's very similar, serves the same function, but just allows you to, to say what you want. It's basically what's going to happen. Well, we need government to actually give citizens more uh access to their private data i think that's the main thing with that they're better with these tech companies though well, so it's like that's probably not gonna happen yeah in terms of communicating that's not like you're always gonna have to like if they like if instagram thinks something shouldn't be on their on their website they have the right to remove it you know it's exactly by that. exactly but should that be the case? Do these companies have too much power in the communication sphere? Because if you look at it, like freedom of speech. I think so. You think they should have the power? No, I said I think they have too much power. They have too much. I think so as well, to I be agree. honest with you. Yeah. I mean, because think about how they make their money. It's off of, the, like, most of them make the majority of their money off of our data and off of selling basically our every move. Yeah. Yeah. They also, they also literally, like, they could like the the CEOs could just totally just push their own narrative and just yeah. say some certain stuff they don't like is bad Dude, and other Google, stuff is good. Google yeah, that's where Jack it gets Square. scary, I think. What? Google hit the anniversary like they didn't they hit the anniversary of Tiananmen Square from search results. Like that's well, pretty they fucked had up. To with China. <laughs> uh in China I, like if you Google Tiananmen Square, I'm pretty sure like in certain parts of China, probably not like Hong Kong, but in certain parts of China, if you Google Tiananmen Square, it it won't come up. Yeah. Like the massacre won't come up. If you Google like it a shit up. ton of stuff in North yeah. Korea, it doesn't come up. <laughs> how are how do you, those countries? How to get to South Korea doesn't show up on the results. <laughs> I don't even know if they have access to Google at that. Not a lot. Yeah. Those countries they probably have like Kim the, Jong Un's like official website as their only browser. How how are they for the free press index? Pretty pretty good. Pretty. <laughs> the fucked up thing is like I don't even know if they're last place. I, I think they're, they're last not. place. Well, I think with freedom, press freedom, they are, but with the amount of arrested journalists, they're not. Because, like, you can't really be a journalist. Because Belarus there. exists. Belarus <laughs> is up there. Well, they throw country. people in the prison for just, they throw people in jail. During, when the Belarus protests were happening against uh, Alexander Lukashenko's election, they were literally throwing journalists into, the, like, police vans with no questions asked. Like, they yeah. didn't even, like... That's the type of government I want to work for. In the country in world. East Africa is actually the worst, believe it or not. Oh, Eritrea. Yeah, yeah. they're um, aren't they at war Eritrea's, though? Well, that's true. No one even knows about them. Syria right? is though. That's apparently, apparently they're the first time I've like, heard their names today. Here. What Eritrea? Eritrea. I've never heard of them ever. I think I've I was heard reading them about that recently. They have uh, yeah. they got like a corrupt dictator right now, right? Yeah. And aren't they having a civil war? Yeah, well, they're involved in like the one in Ethiopia. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 
So, I saw something about that. But um, yeah, it's it's mostly countries that are going through some sort of civil insurrection, like Belarus. I mean, Russia. That's not even like unrest. They just like. I mean, I guess they had unrest with the Navalny, but Putin just has like his shit locked down. He has like RT, which is like one of the biggest media companies in the world. That's the thing. Like countries with state media, like. People respect Always like the goes BBC. Well. well, people respect like the BBC, and people respect like uh, like France twenty four. Like um, but like state Dude, media in state a lot of countries is, is best, not bro. great. Well, BBC is pretty great. I think it's really yeah. International. Well, when you have press freedom, it's fine. But when you have like RT or TRT, which are just like yeah. mouthpieces for the <laughs> propaganda, government, yeah, like uh. It's just like, yeah. And uh, remember, wasn't it Trump who said like he, he wants that he because he kept calling everything fake news, which is funny because the guy in Belarus, Lukashenko, he actually arrested people on the basis of fake news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, oh, that's it's great. Awful, bro. He's like, guy. look at that man over there. That is the leader of America. Fake news, fake news. Put him in yeah. jail. <laughs> and um, yeah, like uh, Trump's. But I think he said at one point, he's like, yeah, we, I should have my own like media because I can't trust it. You know what I mean? yeah. It's just like, I don't know. I feel like you. the whole point I'm trying to make with this subject is like, I'm just worried because I feel like you've never seen um, in a long time this kind of crackdown on press freedom in like more developed countries I think like it's one thing if it's one thing if it's happening in like you know what it kind of feels like it feels Djibouti, a bit like it feels a bit like uh the 30s like the early 1930s atmosphere where like journalists are becoming more and more under threat almost yeah. where it's like there's like there's Hitler this fall back into populism and i think people like to think populism is pro-population but it's a lot more dangerous than establishment politics. It really is. Yeah, it is. It's not a solution. Like it, it, it was tried and it's failed for a reason. Like because it tends to end in either genocide or or mass murder and shit like that. Like it doesn't really yeah. ever end until it goes too far. Yeah. Yeah. Or ISIS is capturing fun. journalists and beheading them on fucking camera. Like, yeah. yeah. Crazy. That kind of shit. Because people don't want to know the truth. The people want to hide the truth. That's the thing. That's yeah. why people are scared of journalists because they're afraid of their, like, especially politicians. They're like the biggest enemy of the journalists. Huh. I that's wonder why. why. <laughs> that's why I'm glad I took politics as a minor because I know how, I can learn how those yeah. fuckers are. And, like, uh, they try to, like, um, they don't want the truth coming out of them. They don't want like the their dirt coming out. Are politicians why... not just open, transparent, like just role models for the rest of us to follow? I think yeah, that like a, Trump, I bro, think... he just like, says what's ever on his mind. <laughs> I think open. a lot of what we're seeing right now is just a huge byproduct, also of just like the the kind of citizen journalism that has started to arise. You know, you mentioned like George Floyd earlier. Like citizen journalism is basically any of us pulling out our phone and taking a video that's going to be seen yeah. worldwide and tell that story even closer than a journalist who gets the story later. And I just think that like now oh, everyone has true. the ability. It's a it, there's a whole I learned about it in a media course I took recently. There's a whole like new thing about citizen journalism it's yeah. massive i was thinking more so from the people who are at the event because i actually think yeah. a lot of the times you get better angles and better footage from the actual yeah. people who are there and a better like retail like with george floyd there's yeah. tons of like civilians that were there that took those camera angles so you got yeah. like a very good understanding but like now like people who are like posting shit on social media like uh like like repost of other things yeah. like now that's it's tough. Yeah. that part well, useless. You, you want the first I mean. person I mean, stories, yeah, yeah. Those you want the means, first port, person. Yeah, you mean like I people you submitting, like uploading their yeah. own video because that's, that's what cool. they tell that us. That I to agree do. with. That's and the what they tell us to do as the journalists. That's what they tell us to do. The truth. Well, they're telling us. Sorry, go ahead. No, get rid of gonna say. He said, she said, gets rid of that bullshit and shows you a yeah. little bit of what yeah. happened. Well, they, yeah. they say yeah. now, like, journalists, like, whether they be, like, because the thing is, like, print journalism, it's, like, it's all online now anyway. So, like, they say that they you want multimedia skills. It's, like, one of the biggest assets, like, to be able to use social media and be able to use different kinds of cameras and audio so you can literally be, like, that 
person who just whips out their camera and starts yeah, filming. Yeah, the two most useful videos in that whole case for the uh, for the trial ended up being the body cams and the first, like you said, the first person audio, like the first person videos yeah. on the iPhone. It wasn't. It wasn't the street cams from across the street. The Seven yeah. Eleven street cams and suck. They're so them. bad. They're no, so. Bad. They don't get anything, dude. I don't know. In they that, caught the marathon they don't get with updated it. Most of the time, audio is good. But like a few months ago, there was like a. I I was in a hit and run. Like someone hit the back of my car. They tailgated me, and like the street cams did fuck all. There's like a street cam four streets down. And it's like another block back. He's Bro, like, yeah, we didn't see it. Street, it's like, yeah, we didn't see anything. Street cams Wait, capture like, less than a frame a second. It's insane to look at. Like, you mean like a, like like a, a building a camera minute. on a building? <laughs> No, it was at an intersection, but it was just like oh, okay, then yeah, because I was gonna say like uh, they one of those like building surveillance people think like you know the little black ones people think they don't do shit, yeah. but like those kind of cameras that's how they like caught the Boston Marathon bomber for example they yeah. used just like a uh, a surveillance camera from a business yeah but they, that, it also used... took like hours of manpower and a lot of yeah, yeah, I, I a lot of investigation so they probably tapped into yeah. some american cell phones too to find some images that were taken that day yeah probably <laughs> well they honestly. used they didn't do that i i know because i spoke to the guy i fucking president. doubt it i fucking but, doubt it i bet you they did do that no nah, i spoke to the guy who who helped Chris. oh yeah because yeah, they're gonna true. tell you so, <laughs> That's well, true. you know, I, mean, I, you know, I did, about, they learned a lot. They learned a lot. I'll tell you this. They learned a lot from the war. They learned a lot from the war in Iraq on how to be able to track down explosions just through surveillance footage. That's yeah. fair. They probably tracked receipts, too, and found out how to make a pressure cooker bomb and, like, looked up people who had bought the ingredients. Those guys it. actually learned how to do it from Al-Qaeda's magazine. I think that's what's ridiculous. That's Wait, fucking outrageous, dude. I didn't know I had a magazine, magazine bro. Yeah, what? what is it, like, who publishes, like... A, a they, bomb ingredient list, and then on the next page, it's, like, a bunch of goats. Do they, do they have, like, a printing, <laughs> right, yeah, like, sure. building where they just have magazines and, like, computer design? They got, like, what? How are they making it and distributing magazines? It's called Inspire, bro. It literally... Really? It, yeah. Wow. Fire, just the name of Fire. Inspire. You guys know we're at an Inspire hour. Inspire terror and others. Yeah. What a. Do we just end it? I should not be plugging that on this fucking episode. I just realized, but regardless, <laughs> yeah. it is important that to spread awareness that this kind of bullshit exists. So if you see like anything related to it, you can report. Yeah, it. Speaking yeah. of global conflicts and events, the Euros have been happening these last few months, and we wanted to give a bit of a brief recap. Uh, so we watched, I didn't watch the original group stages, but we watched from the rounds of 16 on. Big surprises were that uh, Switzerland beat France, so France got kicked out. I think that was in their round of 16, or was it? Um, it was yeah, and then they lost to Spain in the quarterfinal. Yeah, quite Spain in the quarters. So they did beat, I feel like that was, biggest upset of the tournament to be honest and then italy who spoiler alert won it all uh the yeah. belgium oh, oh, fuck you <laughs> spoiler alert won it all uh the yeah. Belgium in the round of 16 and then beat, oh no, wait, was that, that might have been in the quarters, and then beat, oh, uh, yeah, Belgium was a quarter, Spain, and then beat Spain in the semis, the semis to yeah. go on to face England, England had such a hard route to, to make it to the finals, <laughs> yeah. okay, let me start it off, yeah. all you England fans out there, first of all, in the round of 16, we played Germany, now Germany is a great team, they're like, they're like, they should have been in the finals themselves, they were sick this year. So let's just begin with that, okay? I don't know about England that. played amazing 2-0 win. It was show, outrageously show good. Team Love likes to uh, <laughs> sniff. Yeah, and sniff he still will win more than Southgate ever will. Or has one more. That's and then, the wait, thing. who did England play in the quarters? In the quarters? Yeah. 
Who was that? Was that? That was that was they played Ukraine. 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 Yeah, the four nil. And they won four four nil. That was another amazing win, dude. Ukraine, such a difficult team. They were fucking. How many games did England play at Wembley? By the way, that's what I'm saying. Like fucking four. Like I think all their games were at home. Like out of the six games they played, like five five of them were at home, dude. Which, to be fair, Denmark played most of theirs at home besides that one they played in Azerbaijan. But then, like, uh, they ended up getting robbed by England um, over a ball. No, 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 no. All right, wait a minute. So, in the semifinals, England played Denmark. Another brilliant win. Refs yeah. were really great that game. That was a good I game. In an Called it how they saw it. Okay. Perfect penalty no call. One. Harry Kane. Tottenham. I don't love him. He's kind of a wanker. But I thought we were being impartial, Jake. Raheem Raheem Sterling was a was man of the match that game. He was sick. Yeah, Raheem Sterling was, so was the best player on England. Yeah. So anyway, then England goes to the final and gets absolutely robbed. Let's go! Let's go! England goes to the final and gets absolutely robbed by a shite ref who forgot to call a penalty when some dude grabs Sokka's jersey. Literally, I mean, some oh, dude, Giorgio color. Chiellini, one of the yeah, greatest Chiellini. defenders of modern modern football. The dude who basically He's, has, I don't know, he just looks funky. One of the greatest dude, he's like fucking still playing. He's in his mid thirties. Kind of looks like you're going to be doing in your mid thirties. Usually, when you tackle someone playing football, you uh you slide with your feet, not grab them not, to the back of their shirt. Yeah. I mean, totally yeah, I'm not excusing the penalty, but huge red card should have I mean, been. It is, yeah, it is kind of fucked up. Like a like 36 year old guy just like, grabs a 19 year old <laughs> shirt. <laughs> Big to mention. That's just that was a that was a rough play yesterday. Oh, any oh, other good. games you guys wanted to mention that were like upsets or? or yeah, so games? I'll mention since I watched like on nearly every game, I'll, I'll I'll talk about some upsets. Um, so I think uh, well another big upset that I that I thought was uh, the fact that the checks. I think the checks were kind of I wouldn't say the dark horse because they didn't make it that far, but they were better than people saw. Dude, Spain was definitely the dark horse. This and uh, Spain, I think, was definitely. the dark horse. I thought yeah. I thought it was gonna be. England too, kind I of. Think Italy, no, I England. think Italy came in and dark horse. Italy, no, yeah, but Italy dark. dominated since the Italy, beginning. Dude, Italy think, was projected before. Dude. They were they were tearing it up in international play even before the tournament. Really? Yeah, because I thought Belgium and France yeah. were projected for like the main favorite. They were projected. Win. Yeah, well, they were projected higher than Italy, but Italy since playing the tournament, like I never felt unconfident yeah. about them winning. Yeah, watching like, them think, play was just so much fun. In their I think Switzerland rounds. and Spain were the two dark horses and. And they played each other. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Switzerland was out on penalty. But yeah, no. So for all you guys, like as you could probably already tell, Jake is a huge lifelong England fan. No, so, I'm I'm a bit plastic. Everyone, I joined. I joined this last month because like I'm a Premier League fan and I can only speak English. So naturally, even though I'm ethnically Danish and Irish, I decided to support the uh the english national team because i like yeah them. maybe by the and next I, world cup jake will be smoking clean. smoking winston cigs and wearing like a full adidas track suit and, and I'm all awesome. i have to say is my one-liner everyone england is my city okay <laughs> yeah so england though england i'll say so just to comment on england england actually i did actually think have a good shot of um even though they didn't score a lot in the group stages, I think their defense was the best of pretty much any teams in the tournament. Um, and Both I think they did like so overrated. Though. Goalie's a bit Pickford, overrated. Pickford, I know everyone Pickford. was like he's the so, keeper of the tournament, but he had like one of the he, best defenses. He didn't have any. No one shot on him, bro. <laughs> I think England had a good shot at making it. Um, I do think it was close against Denmark though. Like, cause see, my team, I, like as Jake met, mentioned earlier, I'm Germany fan. I actually grew up supporting them um from my dad but i had it's just weird because then they got eliminated in um knockout stage i'm not used to that so then i have to pick denmark just because of because of my cousins so That's um That's denmark sure. yeah denmark i thought would i actually really thought they had a chance to beat england not gonna lie that game i think was pretty close it i was. think people were too dismissed i was kind of robbed from denmark i don't want to like i know i just supported just started supporting England, but like that call that was like 
Dude, Sterling went down. There was no penalty in the box, dude. He just yeah. fell. So it was kind of bullshit. But and Harry Kane basically. Like, I agree with that. Like, and then yeah, also like the fact that Schmeigel was able to save his um. His Schmeigel penalty. also fucked it. He should have caught it. I don't know why. Yeah, Schmeigel had such a good game. That entire game, he was just on, and then just that one rebound, and Kane Kane took it. To me, yeah. To me, the keepers of the tournament are Schmeigel and Jan Sommer from Switzerland. I would say, nah. and actually, I'd put Donnarumma up there too. Yeah, Donnarumma for sure. But Sommer to be able to save like the war- defending world champions penalty, like the thing is, that, why I agree with Jake that that's the biggest upset is France. Literally, everyone thought would just destroy them, and even during the game, they had it in the bag three one, and they managed to blow that and then lose on penalties. Yeah, that's if, crazy. If Pickford, if Pickford makes the English team. During the World Cup season, I'm going to fucking blow a gasket. Dude. He's such a talentless bottle right, job. Enough, enough with oh, England. Easy. We're talking about the other. The, to answer your question from earlier, the upsets. I think another huge upset was the Holland check. The fact that France, Holland, and Germany were all knocked out before teams like Switzerland and teams like Denmark. Yeah, there were that, tons of well, Germany was kind of Germany wasn't that good. They, they weren't that great, but um, they're just like. It's if just they not, were projected, they might have been projected to be better than they were, though. To be honest, see, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a bone to pick in this whole thing because I didn't, I didn't follow the Euros the whole time. But at least I Italian, so you take some pride. Yeah. <laughs> I rooted for Italy yesterday. As a as a past soccer player, I'll just comment on yesterday's game and just say um, England looked way more spaced out and. Italy definitely looked like they relied a lot on their speed and also just like. Their their form of defense is more to congest the center as opposed to I felt like most of the game England just looked like they played a little more spread out defensively. Yeah, um, yeah. But I thought it was a great game yesterday. If you uh, if you watch like Italy Spain's game, those were two teams that just rely on like pure speed for like yeah yeah. So that that was a really fun game to watch, and we're like. Yeah, like teams like England, like it's more traditional where it's like, like get the it's ball. More based on yeah, it's yeah. more based Honestly, on buying uh, players out of the box. Yeah. Like Italy England deserved it though because like to be honest, England had a very easy path, but Italy had to play Belgium, Spain, and then England all in a row. Like yeah. Yeah. they honestly had such a difficult because Belgium probably came with the tournament. As, as they did. Yeah, yeah. So like they were the best team in the entire oh. tournament. Yeah. I didn't even remember another big upset. I mean, to be fair, I think they're a bit overhyped, but Portugal also getting eliminated. But Ronaldo still was like the top scorer top of the scorer, tournament. Yeah, yeah that's, that's that just wild. shows you how much he like cares. Did he get eliminated in the round of sixteen, or like the didn't he get eliminated. Yeah. In no, groups? they got knocked out no. before the round of sixteen. Didn't oh yeah, you know, I think it might have been make it out of groups, bro. And he still yeah, had might have been goals. Goals. Yeah, the most goals, and <laughs> Dude, they, could, they still couldn't get out of groups. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah they not. were in the group of death though with France and Germany. So uh, that's not even really Hungary. Hungary yeah. actually played pretty well. The man literally Germany. went off, and his team couldn't defend fucking anything. <laughs> like the group of useless wankers, Germany and France. Yeah, uh, that was a pretty good group. Eng- yeah, group England's group was so hard. Scotland, and they couldn't beat Scotland. That was also one of the best games. Just the fact that they couldn't even score on them. I think the best part of yesterday's game was the Scott, the one you sent or put on your Instagram story was like Scotland, Scotland fans all showing up to for Italy. Yeah. They were like, yeah, they were like, thank, thank you for fucking England. Yeah, really. they were like, let's get the job done, Italy. So and they yeah. had the they had the Terminator thing too. The will yeah. be back in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Scotland hates England, but to be fair, most uh, uh European countries most are not fucking with England because they're all, cocky as dude, hell. Dude, most of Let's Europe talk about wants. the England fans for a bit. All the Nord- yeah. all the Nordic countries like Denmark, Switzerland, or sorry, not Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Sweden uh, Finland, Norway, Germany, like Germany's they all said England was kind of brick. Northern England's Germany. more Nordic they than Germany. Wanted, not except in Scotland. Scotland, Ireland, they all wanted England to lose. Not a single one of them wanted England. To lose. Well, so did Italy, and like, uh, bro, no one was rooting for your home country, Drake, huh? 
England fans, oh, England's oh, fans, oh, they oh. do shit like boo the anthems. Like it's just, it's ironic because England, England like puts on this pers- this image of being like such a classy, like sophisticated and civilized country, even though we know they're not really because of their history. But they put on that front, oh, they are. and then they'll do shit like that. They'll boo their own players who got them to the semifinal the first time in fifty years, and do like abuse online. That was- all right, so last point is, um, so after the England-Italy game, and Italy had been declared the winner after PKs, they won by a narrow margin in PKs. Um, England fans afterwards started spreading abuse online, specifically I think it was Twitter, against uh, Bukayo Saka. I don't know Sancho's first name. Jaden Sancho. J- Jaden Sancho. Marcus Rashford. So these these three players are all um, of African descent, and there was a uh, or Caribbean or Caribbean. Sorry. Yeah. Then there was racism um, kind of projected onto them from English fans, um, and there were politicians. Boris Johnson came out and uh, and you know he he was like in support of the three players and he denounced any racism that was happening inside England. I'm sure other major politicians did as well. Yeah. Um, labor and uh, liberal and conservative parties as well. So I don't, I it was like unfortunate yeah. to see it. So like, I don't know what your guys thoughts on it, but like we obviously all are, are like, we love Bakayo Saka too. And we stand against racism in any form. It, it makes yeah. me sad. Me and Jake as Arsenal fans, it, it kind of it hits close to home. And also, the fact that um, it wasn't yeah. like it just reflects poorly on the because uh, I know there are a lot of great passionate England fans who just love it's their country. Reflects it's poorly like, on on national fans, that, but it reflects poor. Yeah, yeah. On a very vocal minority, the problem is though, even if, like say one percent of national fans are racist, in a group of of of. Six sixty million. That's still six hundred thousand people. So even yeah. a small well, not percentage to, of your make a lot of noise. Not to go to the full overgeneralized route, but to be honest, like the you know we I know there's been a lot of discussions obviously in the past year about the problems here and and some of BLM is carried over in other countries, but it's it's so bad in England. Like racism is just so rampant. I mean, you see everything just happened with the royal family situation. Yeah. Um, and there's just a lot of, th- I mean, to, to be completely honest with you, um, not to go back to this, but even like a good film example, like the first, um, the first black filmmaker who was a woman, the first film that was released was a film called welcome to the terror dome. And it came out in like the nineties. Like that was, that was when the first, like, you know, wait in England. Pro- in England, yeah. Wow, and there's yeah. a there was another film I saw recently called uh, Babylon. It was about uh, like DJ like reggae DJs basically who were um, like full like first generation British citizens, but because of their skin color, like the whole movie was about xenophobia and racism and and just how prevalent it is. That movie came out in like 1980, and it wasn't even it was banned from the country. It was, wow. uh, you know, nine years before Do the Right Thing uh, by Spike Lee. It was the the same response. They banned the movie because they were afraid it was going to cause, like, racial injustice and outcries. Yeah, and, I mean, and, no, like, I actually, you know what's weird about, uh, like, English and American society are almost, almost reflections of each other in the way yeah. their racisms have developed. I feel like a lot of the racism you see in America yeah. is actually, like, in a sense, like very similar to English racism. Well, I think it's in, very it's similar like, correlations. Well, it's built on the colonial like history. Last night, yeah. though, too, like the the tweets that were put up. Like, I, I think there's also a lot of American culture and a lot of racism that's prevalent here. That's more just like quiet, like behind the scenes or quiet or Indeed. like yeah. It's, it's everywhere though, yeah. still too. Well, I mean, a, lot no, actually, tweets, what a lot of these tweets from last night, though, man, are, like, horrendous. Like, they're yeah. very, yeah. very vulgar. And, yeah, but the like, thing about social media is, like, like in person, you'll never see these people ever talk like that. Then they go on with these accounts and say the most horrendous the shit account. they can think of. Yeah. yeah. It's like, but their name is still linked to a lot of them. Yeah, a lot yeah. of them probably, like, a, 
And I mean, nowadays with social media, you find a community of people who are like, fuck yeah, you're so right to that crazy bullshit. Yeah. The problem is honestly probably even worse in Europe because if you think about how multicultural America is, like, what does a, t- a typical American look like? We're such a melting pot of a country that I honestly think it'd probably be a lower percentage of us. But like, when you're not exposed to other countries or cultures, sorry, yeah. other cultures, you tend to be more narrow-minded in your thoughts think, towards yeah, other people. I think sometimes Europe, it like, goes the other way too, though, because you don't how always that see. Even- it makes a ton of sense because when there's like plenty of interaction then people build stereotypes based on negative interactions that might have like nothing to do with general but more po- but that's like just well, you don't see stereotypes stereotypes the country wait wait, wait. the country that's most tolerant of minorities in europe is fucking iceland based on a poll like iceland you rarely see them because yeah. they think it's just something like interesting how many they get people from other white people are in iceland that's what yeah, i'm saying exactly. so it's not always based <laughs> on the uh, lack thereof also, sometimes stere- it's stereotypes just, aren't based it's on, based on history and based, based on, on culture on... and the thing is because what alec was saying earlier i was gonna make a good point so actually a lot of or no i think jake said it it's not always um quiet so it's actually like in so eastern europe and like they get like a bad eastern and like the mediterranean countries some of them they get a really bad rep for having really loud hooligans who do like uh, far right salutes and chants and like make really racist comments towards minorities, and everyone kind of knows that and they they're warned of that. Like England players when they were playing uh, um, Bulgaria, they would do that. They'd blew, boo every time it was a black fan or black player getting the ball. Jeez. So they like they they walked. I think they actually were gonna walk off the field and they like decided that they would just keep playing because they beat them five nil. So. But like, uh, like, yeah, so no, but what I was, the point I was saying is a lot of, um, I've seen, I've heard a lot of, um, minority players say it's the silent, like abuse on social media. That's worse. Like people, yeah. there can be fans that'll like, yell and be assholes in the stadium, but it like, and that tends to be more common in like more developing countries, like in Eastern Europe, um, just cause they don't like, like to what Jake's point, that is an instance where they don't really know better cause they don't have that kind of history with it. With the pe- with those people living there, but well, uh, this is the other the thing silent, too. Is like people think in like silent racism is like, worse for the yeah. sense that you're not willing to stand by. At least if if you're a racist at the stadium, you're a piece of shit. But you yeah. actually stand by what you're saying. All these fucking computer warriors are fucking cowards. Yeah, also, right. what I was also trying to like, say, uh, what I was trying to just the people think diverse countries like England is much more diverse now than it used to be. They think that kind of stuff can't happen anymore because of that they deny it and that's the problem because at least in eastern europe you, like the people know that there's a problem with racism for the most yeah. part and sometimes people mm-hmm. pretend it all races are pretty no, much cowards a, a lot of people is, are like this can never happen in england england's so progressive racism exists in every country in the world it's everywhere yeah. it's like it's an it's, it's such an individual thing like there's it's no, something like, humans will never advance on from until there's some branch of evolution beyond our species yeah. essentially because and humans are inevitably flawed moments, with certain issues i think moments like this now with social media now get uh now that there's so much attention on them now more than ever people will actually look into like their own bias and stereotypes and question like they should what do i believe in you know or at least the people who care enough about being better people yeah that's true it takes self-awareness though i think like a lot of racism is unconscious because if you're not that bright yeah if you're not that bright think about it you're very like we're all very self-aware people you reflect on things you've done in the past and you change to become better in the future a lot of people don't think of that it doesn't cross their mind and that's why it goes unsolved because you're like oh i'm not racist for xxx but think about what have i done that I can do better in the past. What have I said? Yeah, yeah. What What are the instances I could have done better trying to help someone out? But I mean, a lot of people don't think that way. They're just like, oh, fuck, yeah. And a lot of people will, will base like one bad experience or something like where they didn't get along with someone, or the, they'll just make generalizations from what they watch on the news or on TV yeah. about like the you worst can't group, a whole group fucking, of any person, any people, any it's like the way. You know what bothers me the most is the way people change what they say to who they're directing their either question or line of communication to. 
if you're talking like if you're talking to like a, a a friend at the pub, one's white and one's black. The way like the way they speak to one and then the way they speak to another. Sometimes you can pick up on a visible difference on how they communicate. That pisses me off more than anything, honestly. I've always been that way. Like when someone asks a question like where are you from? That that question pisses me off so much. It's like would you ask that question if if that person like would you actually ask that question? I always that always bothers me personally. I don't know how you guys feel about any of that, but it's always just feels so yeah. it feels condescending, especially like if they ask it normally, maybe it doesn't matter as much, but a lot of the times it's condescending. It's like it's same, probing. It's probing. the same thing as like you're expecting, well, the way you're expecting it, someone else to answer your ignorance and to explain yeah. well, something way, you don't understand. The way mm-hmm. I kind of deal with that uh, is like when they say say that I say, "Oh, I'm from New Hampshire," and then mm-hmm. if they're like, "Oh no," but like where it's like, "Does it matter?" I just told you where I'm from. Like who? Yeah, it's a good way of handling. It. But you know what I mean? It's like the way like they if ask. That answer is not going to satisfy. Yeah, like it's not going to satisfy. Is it going to satisfy? The, like that's the answer to your question that's where the fuck i'm from so what more do you are you yeah. trying to what it's, more it's trying just a small example out? but they do that with a, like a, even the way they speak to people like p- post that question it's like condescending yeah. it's like yeah. i know better than you just yeah i think that's what they i, I they call that. microaggressions i think it's yeah. it is it. it is microaggression uh trevor noah actually he had like a little bit on this he was like I much prefer the racists in like South Africa to the ones here, cause it's like, like yeah. he's like in South Africa, they'll be like, "Get the fuck out of my face, you black piece of shit." But then, yeah, here in America, uh, it'll like racism will be like, "Oh, hey, I'm not a racist, but these people." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so like, no, it's, it's, it'll be it's way more horrible in any form. Yeah, and it is. No, and it's you hard, wish that we could evolve. It's like you said, Jake. Like we 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 haven't evolved past this yeah. because there's a lot of people who don't care to, and there's also there's just a fucking like it, it's sadly a fact of history and of evolution. Like people like to stay with their groups, and yeah. that's you know it's it's tribal it's shit. Tribal. It's I was tribal. gonna say it's tribal. not grown yeah, it's past tribal. experience. It's horrible that we haven't moved past this, or that certain people, I guess you should say haven't moved yes yeah. the certain the unfortunately is, vocal subtle racism i would assign that to a lot more people than like the audience would care to think like i think a lot more people exhibit subtle racism towards people than than like is, is comfortable well, everyone to. everyone has bias like everyone innately I, has bias yeah. so but it's, i don't know there's difference between bias and actual discrimination or, or microaggressions to me there's, well, there's microaggression, a difference oh we've all done microaggressions like microaggressions are a lot more uh than like what you would think but i don't think the thing is i don't think we actually target micro microaggressions. Like, like saying america is a melting pot is a microaggression yeah. How was that a micro? Right? Earlier this so show. the the reason why the reason why it's considered a microaggression is it implies that when new people come here, uh, that they have to assimilate into the culture that's already here. Like they have to adapt to us as opposed to us accepting them. That's how that's a microaggression. That's I mean, fair, actually. I yeah. didn't see melting pot meaning that. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. nah, I never that's thought right. of, that's what I'm saying. We've all done, everyone has said a microaggression at some point in their life. You that don't is know true. it's a that's microaggression. Yeah, that's for sure yeah. true. So, basically, yeah, so that's just like a little bit of our discussion on the recent events going on with the Euro. Um, it We just wanted to make, make it clear, though, like, uh, we we all love the sport of soccer we all love football as so many people call it and um we're really hoping things change we're, we're really sad and our hearts go out to these players who have to deal with these abuses um football is a sport that should be for everybody it's played in all corners of the world i grew up playing it so jake he literally got into it not even that long ago he's a huge passionate fan um, one thing I lo- I've always loved about playing like at Suffolk is I meet people from countries I'd never even thought I'd meet people from. Like this is uh, as the England FA put out today, it's community, it's family, it's unity, and it's home. 
it's something that should be tolerant for everybody. Yeah. So we'll we'll wrap this week's episode up on that. Thank you guys for sticking with us with your support during our hiatus. Um, thank you for subscribing to the channel and keep up your support with the videos. Uh, we appreciate the likes and the comments. Uh, check out our Instagram, straightnochaser.ent. We're going to make sure more content is coming out soon. So teaming up with these for guys more. for a little little special content little this special week. Thing. Yeah, we're <laughs> yeah. getting a lot more variety out. Or we're having, we have it planned, oh, a yeah. lot more variety in our content. So make sure you guys keep up the support. We really appreciate it. So this was episode, what number was this? 32. 32, 32. straight no chaser. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next week.